Hello everybody, I'm very pleased you're joining me today. Um, I have a wonderful guest, Susan Venker, who's a marriage and relationship coach. Hello, Suzanne. Hi, Bettina, how are you? It's, is it Suzanne or it Susan? It is Suzanne. It is Suzanne. Suzanne. Thanks for asking. And do I call you <laughs> Tina? Or I'm always calling you oh, Bettina, well. but I hear people call you Tina. But, but, but I have this sort of public private thing. And uh, so my, I'm not known well, publicly as Bettina, but you could, anyway, I don't mind. All my Got friends it. call me Bettina. So okay. there you go. <laughs> awesome. Um, now, Suzanne is host of a, a podcast series, the Suzanne Venker Show, and written many articles. Um, interesting articles about relationships and marriage and so on and books and you have a new book coming out do you want to tell us about that yeah i'm really excited about it so it's it comes out in august august 31st but it's available now for pre-order at amazon so anyone who's listening in and can't wait to get their hands on it can go right now and, and do so it's called how to get hitched and stay hitched which i think yeah. is very very timely and the <laughs> subtitle is even more significant and that is a 12-step program for marriage minded women. And this is basically a book that says, Hey, listen, ladies, you've been lied to big time. So part one of the book outlines four lies, the cultures, the culture tells women. And then the part two of the book is the 12 step program, which is designed to completely debunk all of that and say, here's the right road. Here's the roadmap that you need to get it right. And, um, and yeah, that's that's about the gist of it. Sounds good. I, even the title will annoy a lot of people. So it will. That's always a good it start. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that and stay hitched is the part is is an important part to add, right? Get get hitched and stay hitched. Stay yeah. hitched. Yeah. So <laughs> they're almost two a, separate a, jobs in, a, in in its own right, you know. <laughs> well, yeah. Getting hitched is hard enough, but staying hitched is, oh, as we know, it's one yeah. of the things we're talking about today. Um, because we want to talk about um, woke women and their po poisonous friends. And and this came out of various things I was reading. We, we've talked before. We had a very popular uh, interview uh, chat before about woke women in general and their relationships, uh, Suzanne. But I started thinking about this whole issue of, of friendship and how the influence of, of women's friends on their relationships and particularly as we say, woke women, we, I suppose we're talking about women who subscribe to all the modern ideology around relationships and feminism and so on. Um, now, I think we, we needed a sort of disclaimer here because I'm not saying that women's friendships aren't important. Friendships have been important to me throughout my life with women and they've been really something uh, that has got me through a lot of tough times. I'm sure the same is true of you. I mean, we're not disparaging female relationships at all. Uh, but we're just saying, I, I think you'd agree that we, we're saying that they can have a really detrimental effect, particularly on women's relationships with men. Is that, would you agree with that, Suzanne? I do agree with that. And I think, um, I mean, the reality is who you spend time with matters and you can, you can, that can be, that can apply to anything, not just relationships. Right. Um, and if you want to be emboldened in your relationship you're not going to feel that way if you're spending a lot of time with women who are man haters or who are miserable in their own marriages or relationships. You're not going to get the feedback you need when you have a problem you'd like to, you know, talk through, let's say, for example. And of course, in the dating world, what we have, the major problem that we have today is for young women who are dating is this just unbelievable epidemic of high expectations yeah. off the chart expectations that women have so that when a woman, and I see this in my coaching all the time, when the woman um, is maybe, you know, pondering whether or not, you know, just having a conversation with her friend about the guy and what's happening with the relationship, it will be very easy for her to say, oh, you need to dump him. He shouldn't be, that shouldn't be happening or whatever, without yeah. any understanding of what's going on on the other end of the equation. It's just always sisterhood, sisterhood. It, it must be him. You know, any problem you have, it must be him. Yeah. yeah. And what I was thinking about all of this, because the difference that's always struck me is that women tend to share with their friends, their good friends, really intimate details of their relationships from, you know, their sexual relationships to everything that's going wrong. They gnaw the bone, they go over all the things that aren't working for them. 
and men, it's much more rare that men have those sort of conversations with their friends about what's going on in their relationships. I mean, and I've had this conversation with many of the men in my life, through my long life, um, who regarded as washing d dirty linen, you know, to yes. talk about, oh, we had this terrible fight this morning. You know, men tend not to do that sort of stuff. And that, and I think that's actually one of the, I mean, I think it can be a terribly positive thing for women because it gives us also a much more realistic idea of what relationships are all about. Whereas men very rarely know much about how their friends' relationships are working out. I mean, some do, but often, you know, men get a total shock when, it, when their mates comes along and says that they're getting divorced because they won't have talked yeah. at all about what was going on in their relationship. Right. Any thoughts? About well, I mean, I think there's some calibration on both people's parts. I mean, for one yeah. thing, I think men should open up more, um, uh, yeah. should feel comfortable with a good close male friend if there are problems that he needs to air out and not feel like he can't go to them. I mean, I, yeah. I don't think being closed off entirely is a good thing. I think male bonding is extremely important. And part of that is yeah. just sharing what's going on in your life. And I don't think that happens at all. I think you're right. And that's not good. That's not healthy. Um, on the other side of the equation, sh women share too much. You know, there's too much conversation about nobody needs to know about the intricate details of your sex life or, or even, you know, any real, real serious marital problems. Now, if you, I mean, it's perfectly fine if you need help with something and you might want to ask, like, do you know of a good therapist, you know, and, and let them know that something's going on, but the friend should not be the therapist. Unless that therapist, unless, excuse me, unless that friend is perhaps really is friends with both of you and really likes your husband, that, yeah. you know what I mean? Because then you're going to get a feedback that's going to be fair and even handed and pro marriage as opposed to, oh, you don't need any of that. You should divorce them, that kind of thing. So you kind of have yeah. to figure out for yourself who you're dealing with before you open your mouth. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's, I think, the critical issue that, uh, it's picking. I don't. I don't. I think it's actually fine to have friends. And I. I have no problem talking about my sex life. And I've never. I think that actually can be very useful in the right context with the yes. right person, the right female friend who, who is is realistic and understands relationship and is in a good, as you say, is in a good relationship herself. I mean, that's the critical thing. If you're telling yeah. someone who's unhappy in their relationship and angry with men and about what's happening in your relationship, it's going to influence the way you, the, the, the feedback you'll get get won't necessarily be helpful. Uh, whereas if you talk to someone who who gets it, who knows how you have to ride through the tough times, who, yes. who knows how you have to accommodate, Agreed. then you'll get very different advice. I mean, I was thinking about back in the early 1970s, um, the women's movement was just really hitting in Australia and there was um, these, you know, the consciousness raising, raising groups, mm -hmm. women everywhere went off to, to examine their vulvas and, you know, to, to do all this crazy stuff, but to, to essentially to talk about what was happening to them in relationships. And it led to this absolute contagion of divorce. I mean, someone, I was talking to someone recently about this who was saying there were groups and groups and groups of women where one person would would separate from her partner and it would just spread. It was like a, a, a um, pandemic of divorce in the 1970s. And that, in fact, the figures are there to back that up. I mean, of course, our divorce laws were changing. Lots of things were happening socially. But what inter interests me about that is this female friendship thing. And when you, one woman is really unhappy and starts talking about what's going wrong in her relationship, so many, often the other people start looking at their own, own relationships much more critically. And that can be so dangerous. Very much so. And actually somebody did do a study of this and, you know, I printed out to bring the exact figures on this and I forgot it in my home. Um, but James Fowler, I wrote about it in one of my books, studied this exact thing. And yeah. it was some crazy figure, like 140% more likely women were if their friend gets divorced to get divorced themselves. <laughs> and if yeah. it's your sibling even higher, or I, I don't have the stats exactly right, but it's, it was off the charts crazy. Yeah. It's, you know, I mean, you can see um, how easily things spread, right? Yeah. Um, in terms of, I mean, it's just with the pandemic alone, we can see how fear spreads so quickly yeah. and easily. Well, I mean, come on, anytime that somebody is going to get somebody close to you and even people who aren't close to you, you see it and you immediately, you immediately have a, um, 
a feeling of like, you think about your own marriage for just a split second. And it's not even necessarily in a serious way, like you're not thinking about divorce, but it just makes you automatically think about your own marriage. It's almost like we're all tied together um, yeah. to, to create a community. And when one piece of that community breaks down, it, it's scary. It, it scares the other people in that community, which is essentially all of us. And so you can, you can see how, if it's a stranger, it's one thing like, like I just ironically, before I came on here, I just read on the news that Bill and Melinda Gates are getting divorced. I don't know if you saw that Oh no! How just sad. announced today. And yeah. I thought of our conversation tonight. Now that's an example of far away people. The average person doesn't know them, but they know of them. Right. Yeah. And then that's one kind of um, contagion, if you will. And then you bring it closer to home with a friend and then even closer with a sibling. And that's what the research shows that it's, you're just that much more likely to get divorced yourself. So it's, it's just so critical that the, that's, it just goes to show you that the people that you surround yourself with, as we said at the beginning matter, it really, yeah. they really do, especially for something like marriage. If you're trying to do it for the long haul, you know, you need support and help. And if people are falling yeah. apart around you, you're going to, where's your support going to be? Yeah. And when you're going through a separation, um, you know, of course, one of the things you do is rewrite your marriage. You rewrite your marital history and things that at the time didn't bother you. You look back and think, oh, yes, when he did that to me, it was meant this. And having conversations with other women, of course, then puts that spin on, as you say, they start thinking about their own relationships and think, what was that coercive? I mean, one of the big discussions in Australia at the moment is they're trying to get coercive um, you know, laws put into place in relation to sexual assault and and um, domestic violence, um, talking about coercive behaviour. And it's always presented entirely as about women being coercive to men. Um, but so a, a behaviour where, you know, a man is not sharing his finance, you know, they're, they're every credit card da, down the line and is keeping some money out because she, she tends to be to, to you know, be running out bills right, too much. Right. And it, that sort of behaviour is now being defined as coercive behaviour oh under our law. And you have a woman who's going through that process and, and is looking at her, her marriage through that, uh, particularly through that sort of feminist lens, mm -hmm. and then starts talking to her friends and say, well, you know, does he share all his money with you? Or does he, I mean, whatever the example we might want to use, it is that po poisoning, that rethinking, that reanalyzing of how we are to interpret our partner's behavior that can be so destructive. Yeah. And I think it's so important not to, I, I I'm really against hugely against so much so that in the book that that's coming out this year, I have a whole chapter on it. Um, I'm really against these crippling comparisons that I think yeah. are absolutely ruining relationships today in a way that, I mean, it's always been there, but we have of course, social media now, and we are all connected in a very different kind of way. So it's very, very, very easy to compare your relationship to your neighbors, or even the person you don't even know who you see on social media it yeah. will ruin your relationship yeah. unquestionably. You do not have the context for what's going on in that other and whatever it is you're seeing. Very That's rarely right. do you ever have the details. So do not ever compare what's going on in your marriage to unless you absolutely know all the details, which you're not going to with most people, not even your close friends. So I think the comparisons are just crippling. Yep. And there's a sort of classic example that comes to mind there is not knowing about what your your friends assumptions are about fidelity is a sort of absolute classic area so women who have a very firm view, view that uh, that um fidelity is critical to any relationship honesty is is everything yep. um, might feel absolutely entitled to tell their friend when they discover her husband is having an affair Oh, she'd want to know, making an oh. assumption. Yeah. And they put themselves in her shoes and things. I, as a friend, I have to tell her. Whereas they have no idea what that woman's assumptions are about that issue. I mean, there are women who still don't want to know. They make assumptions that there are more important things in their marriage than, ha than fidelity, that um, it, unless it's a relate, you know, if, if, a, mm -hmm. if they partner was to stray and have an overnight thing something that didn't impact on the marriage 
and, and could, they take that view that there are extramarital relationships that aren't damaging to the relation to their marriage, um, and they're deliberately turning a blind eye to that. And so you're we, saying we, don't don't. Um, like put your presume, values or like, your ideas onto other people and assume that they're operating with the same set of rules. Absolutely, because yeah. there have yeah. always been women in our community who make that decision. Who, I mean, women who aren't terribly interested in sex and who, die, who some of them explicitly say to their partners, I don't man. I was actually talking so, to a man the other day who, who, wrote, who, who um, wrote to me saying that like 20 years ago, he came to me for advice about this, the, uh, being in a marriage where there was very little sex, loving his wife, um, very good marriage. And she would said to him, I don't mind what you do. There were, I can't remember, there were three rules. One of them was, um, as long as you don't embarrass me, as long as you, you know, she didn't want to be in a situation of people knowing he was having extramarital relationships and, and feeling, you know, putting right, her right. in a position she regarded as, as shameful. Uh, and I said, you are such a lucky man. I mean, that you're with a woman who's capable of having a rational conversation about that, spelling out what mm -hmm. would, what, what her rules were. Um, and you absolutely have to, you know, cherish that woman uh, and not break those rules. And, you know, and, but anybody else, there, there would be huge numbers of women out there who would presume that that woman wants to be told if they oh, are yeah, yeah, having yeah. an affair. You know, that whole, we, we feel we have a right to be our brother's keeper. We have a right to make decisions for other people about their moral decisions. I can't um, even conceive of, of getting involved in somebody else's marriage, I mean, period. I just, unless but, I was invited in, it just wouldn't even dawn on me. But it happens all the time. That, with that particular example, this absolute, if you read the women's magazine, there's an absolute presumption that if you discover your your best friend's husband is having an affair, you go and tell her. So then the idea behind that must be, again, the sisterhood, right? Yeah. You're being wronged. And so I need to tell you because the big bad man, meanwhile, meanwhile she might be accepting of it. And so it's none she of your business. Right, or, I see. Yeah. yeah. Or she, for various reasons, she might not, you know. She, right. She might, if you put her in a situation, or I've, I've talked women through this sort of situation where they discover their husbands are having an affair. They get a lot of pressure from their friends to turf him out. And they don't want to, they still believe that the marriage works for them. Um, uh, you know, may be very hurt by discovering this or whatever, but it, the friends can be so destructive in that relationship of claiming that that's the most important thing that 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 affair denigrates anything else they ever had mm. together. I mean, you know, it's the same sort of thing you're talking about, yeah. making assumptions about what is valuable to other people in their relationships. And we don't have the right to do that, but women universally now seem to have assumed that right. Much I don't more have, so than men. Much yeah. more so than I think it's pretty rare that men tell each other that that, that you know they've heard that their the wife is having an affair. No, I don't know. no, absolutely not. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's the advantage of men being <laughs> close, little, more keep, close. Yeah, right, right, keeping things close to their chest or whatever, whatever that yeah. phrase is. Um, yeah. yeah, I yeah. mean that's yeah. There's advantages to not 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 sharing too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then and then this whole thing, you know, we've talked before, Suzanne, about the whole issue of sex in a relationship and talking this through with women who are, you know, making their own decisions about um, what what their attitude to, to mm -hmm. is towards sexual obligations in the marriage. Mm -hmm. And there are women who are very sexually generous and who would never knock their partners back because they, they recognise that um, it's not just about desire it's not just about sexual frustration it's about that man wanting to feel loved and wanted and not wanting to feel rejected and so i've had women who've talked to me about feeling that way and you know always making the effort to try to not you know obviously not 100 percent of the time but wherever possible say yes. not, not say to yes. knock him back yeah <laughs> say yes say yes, yes good idea and their friend and friends finding that idea absolutely I abhorrent um, how can you think like that? That's 1950s thinking, you know, and that it's been a sort of classic area where the cultural mm -hmm. assumptions now about are about 
say no. You have a right to say no. Say no whenever you feel like it. And to think that a woman will can live with that idea of making a huge effort to say yes, it's is anathema to many women. Now. Yeah, it's just mind blowing. It's one of the many things that is the reason why modern marriages are failing or in relationships. Yeah. I just didn't say just marriages, modern relationships and marriages both are failing. There's a lot of reasons why. Um, but that is that is one of them. It's a mentality that you bring to the table that everything is about whether I'm in the mood or I feel like it, or I, yeah. I mean, first of all, if you waited, if women waited around with wives, I should say wives and mothers who've been married a long time, waited around for the moment that they felt amorous, they'll be waiting a long time because yeah. it requires for women a whole different set of, um, I don't know what the word is. Um, the environment has to be just so where it, in a way that it doesn't for the man, right? Like if you remove- Everything has to be just so. <laughs> I mean, Every everything is so happens. hard for men because they can't always set the, set the stage just so. But the reality is if you really want to get the best out of your wife, remove the children, get her out of the house, take her to a hotel for the weekend. You will find that woman that you fell in love with if you're struggling well, in your marriage. Well, I, I, Suzanne, I must point out that I've, I've often talked about that and I always say, you know, take her for a holiday to Bali, one of the <laughs> Asian destinations for us in, here in Australia. And men are always saying to me, I've taken her to Bali and nothing happened. Oh, I mean, no, you, that's terrible. Well, unless, I mean, it's all the mindset, as yeah. you've always said, too. Unless women have a willingness to be receptive, have a willingness, you won't be seduced unless you want to be seduced. You won't, even in the most perfect setting, unless you feel... I'm going to make the effort to feel aroused and feel interested and feel desire. Right. Whereas happen. for men, it doesn't work that way. Right. No. So, so it's an, it's an uneven thing from the get go and we can't change that. That's how no. we are made. And so we have to cater to that. So if you want a man to cater to your needs for romance or setting the stage or, you know, getting you in the mood in whatever way that means for you, then you have to reciprocate and understand, well, he doesn't need that. That's where the yes comes in when you don't necessarily feel like it. He doesn't need all of that. So give back out of the goodness of your heart. And by the way, we're not asking you to do something that's painful or horrible. And if it is, that's another conversation, right? But well, those but people also, are not suffering to, through it, you right? Don't have to have, you don't have to have intercourse. You can give pleasure in yeah. other ways. <laughs> Quite straightforward. And that, you know, um, so that's part of a, a, a bigger conversation, really. Yeah, it is. Um, I just wanted to move on. So we've been talking a bit about the the influence of women in marriages, of friendships on women's marriages. But I'm also I spent a lot of time in my life looking at what's happening in when one couple start to separate. And you know there are various courses you can take there, and one is to try to minimize the damage on your partner, um, to not get too vindictive, to, um, I mean, I went through a marital separation and I had a wonderful counselor who used to talk to me about the, the moral high ground and how you want to look back on that really painful experience and think you did the right thing. And she was mm -hmm. so right that, you know, there was often choices you could make about how much money you asked for, about and all sorts of things. And you can either put yourself in a situation where you think I didn't, you know, I did everything I could to stop this getting too mm -hmm. destructive or you can go the other route. And that, that's where women's friendships really worry me uh, because mm -hmm. it is so easy to have a little cheering squad saying, oh, you can get more money than that. Or mm -hmm. you, you don't have mm -hmm. to let him see the children every two week or you don't, whatever it is, or don't give just joint custody, you know. Um, uh, and I think Women who've been through that experience and behave badly are often encouraging other women to behave badly. And of course, that's a terrible time to be, that's a, let me say that differently. It's, that's a really easy time to be influenced because you're so vulnerable. Yeah. You're so miserable. You're beaten down. I was divorced once in my twenties too. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't no. have, we didn't have any children though. So the, you know, it's just a different ball game all the way around, but, um, but you're in this very vulnerable state and you're, the, it's just awful. The experience is, is emotionally devastating. So to have somebody come along and be, I can't imagine if I had children with them and then someone coming into my life and, and that's just, it, it, yeah. no, <laughs> just it's just bad, 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 bad. 
and you're angry and there's every reason to it's feeding want, it. want to punish somebody yeah you want to, and you need people around you to say be kind you yes know, right i mean make good decisions for that you will look back on with pride rather mm-hmm. than decisions which which your children will look and it's also the children i was just watching a wonderful video um of a oh so sad a young woman in her early 20s who'd been caught up in a horrendous divorce situation with her father being denied contact. And, you know, she's talking about she was allowed, or whatever it was, a 10 minute phone call a week from her father. And she talks about what that felt like as a child to not be allowed to ring up dad and say, I got a, you know, a good mark in my test today. I mean, not be allowed to talk to her dad uh, and being caught in the middle of this conflict. And of course, I mean, this is happening everywhere and you know yes there are good friends out there encouraging women to look um to look look to the children's needs but there are also many many friendships which which encourage women to as i say to behave badly and not to think about the children's real needs and to put their own anger and resentment first and I mean, it's absolute tragedy and and there. misery loves company if they're if they're divorced themselves that's probably I would think that would be more common with people who are divorced themselves, right? Than happily, like, like I would never, a Absolutely. happily married person wouldn't tell you to, wouldn't talk like that to somebody who's getting no. divorced. If anything, we're trying to save, help save the marriage if, you know, help if we can, or at least be a, an ear to listen without saying anything negative if you're happily married. So these are, it's just misery loves company, I would think. Yeah. But it's also, you know, it's also this assumption that the woman's needs are primary. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, uh, interesting personal example was I was when I was very young I my first marriage was to a man who'd been married before and I so I was from in my early 20s a stepmother um, to two children um, and it was a a long battle to you know this marriage had ended very badly and the the mum was very hurt by that and it took her a long time to allow dad to have any contact with his children and then let alone we eventually got joint custody and it was one of the big achievements of my life Mm -hmm. to achieve a to you know reach a point of harmony of the kids coming back and forth and and the two women the two wives of this man you know being able to talk in a civilized you know friendly manner about the kids needs and all of that and then that, that my first husband died and he um which was totally out of the blue, a 37-year-old having a heart attack. And we found ourselves in this extraordinary situation of these, this joint custody without the man in the middle. Oh. And what was fascinating for me is a number of my f- friends who'd watched me go through agonies over step parenting, which is such a difficult business. Mm-hmm. And they would say to me, oh, well, at least you don't have to worry about those kids anymore. And I just, that just blew me away. What? Oh my God, that's I mean, terrible. I mean, it was all about, look after your, I mean, I was yes. in a yeah. dreadful state and I'd just had my own baby. We had a, a five month old baby. So, I mean, they were thinking of me, but that was the whole point. Women tend yeah. to think of each other and so, build each other up and look after each other and don't necessarily think about you know, the other issues. That yeah. Really and, and I think the, the, that that's really interesting of how it works when you're dealing with separation and divorce. But I do think the real, and I'll use that word again, epidemic is, is the dating world. Oh yeah. I, it, I mean, I'm working with, I work with, with young women. Most of the people I work with are actually married. I'm helping married couples, but um, maybe 20%, 25 are single women. And they, you know, they're basically, they're older and they're ready to get married and when they they tell me stories about telling their friends about something about the guy they're currently dating and if it could be the most innocuous quality and they're telling them telling her to get rid of them that kind of thing He's i had to say him. basically do not talk to your friends at all if you don't have any friends who are positive and non-feminist and true um you know, pro men lovers and women, you know, then forget about it. Don't share anything. You're never, that's never going to work. So yeah. they almost have to be groomed to just forget about your friends, which is really hard to do. You know, yeah. when you're, especially when you're single and you're not married with children yet, you really are very focused on your friends, but you yeah. have to be really selective about 
who you share what with. That's the, that's, if there's any message to this, it's that be very yeah. selective. doesn't mean you have to dump them. It just means you just, you decide who you can say certain things to and who you can't. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And part of it is this whole, and I, I, I think of sex in the city, this whole, you know, mm -hmm. this, these perfect example, yep. constantly building each other up, constantly telling each other how wonderful they are, you know, and that they're entitled to the best and you shouldn't settle uh, for someone who's not good enough for you. Um, and that all is part of this conversation uh, that no one comes up to scratch or that, I mean, I love the, the sort of, when I, you know, I've talked to you before about when I used to do dating coaching and, and helping women yeah. to write their profiles and so on. And, you know, the women's friends would say, no, 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 you don't need to lose any weight. He will love you as you are. I mean, this assumption <laughs> that the, the real, you know, the pat man who deserves you will see past those, you know, 30 right. extra kilos. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. And, crazy, um, crazy. And, yeah. And I used to have such, I mean, that, that the, the problem of the overweight woman in the, in the dating market is a very real one. Um, but often she is surrounded by friends who tell mm -hmm. her, you know, that's you. you, you don't have to change for men, you know, you know, and it, you know, if people aren't I shocked know where by to that, start with that one, isn't it? I know. Yeah. And, but, but here's something that immediately puts it in perspective. I think, imagine if men said to other men, you don't have to settle. You, you deserve the best. You need to find the best kind of woman. She needs to be A, B, C, D, and don't settle for anything less than that. Just imagine if men talk that way, women would be, what are you talking about? Right? Yeah, you should, yeah. Going back to what you were saying about accepting me as I am, you know, it's just, yeah. it's not equal. This is just for women now. Yeah. And yeah. women are so judgmental. Uh, I mean, when I was working, so I'd be working sometimes with the men and, I, you know, there's a funny thing about <laughs> older men on the dating market with terrible teeth. Have you ever come across that? No. Because <laughs> it's usually wives or women's or men's partners who say, yes, you must spend, you know, $10,000 on a new implant for that front tooth because you can't walk around with a missing tooth. And yet when he's not got a wife anymore or he'll go on a date. I mean, the number of women who came back to me and said, he was a terrific bloke, but he had, you know, a hole here, <laughs> yellow teeth. And because no one is saying to him, no, you know, you cannot go out like that. I remember my elderly father lost a very prominent tooth in, when he was in his 80s. He said, oh, why would I waste the money on that? Because my mother died by then. Um, right. Yeah, but it, it's about it's about vanity and men's lack of vanity and the fact that they don't, they get, the, you know, they'd much rather spend the money on whatever. Yes. Yeah. Although that's pretty extreme. I mean, that's, that's yeah. I no, but it's, it's, it was classic. Um, of 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 men and and yet the women you know they have to have good teeth they have to have this they have to have that you know I mean often men would turn up in in jogging gear I mean no one's dressing them anymore <laughs> I mean I, look at this is I know I'm sounding as if I'm belittling men and I'm not meaning to but there is this issue of women are the ones who usually nag their partners to present themselves in a certain way and yes, many men I mean don't care. And I, I suppose arguably, why should they? But when they want to go out and present themselves on the dating market, they have to, you know, they, they need to be, I used to send people along to certain shops and say, get someone to fit you out. And at least for that first date, you have to look. Because women judge everything. And if you turn up in, in you know, the wrong jogging, in jogging shoes to a date at a restaurant, they yeah. won't even look at you. And all that sort of nonsense. Um, and part of it is this echoing of what will my friends think mm -hmm. of this man? What, and you know. that's, you know, that's, um, I don't think we're going to get that part out of women. You know, I mean, that's in them, you know, that goes, that goes way back. Pe women do care what other people think of their man. I mean, to some degree, you know, you could argue the same thing, I guess, for men, right? They like to have the young, pretty thing on their arm. Is that for themselves or is that for show? I don't know. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I think it's, I think it's both. I mean, I, I think a lot of, I mean, why wouldn't I, w I would like, you know, I, I, we all like young people because they're beautiful and we know they're beautiful. <laughs> and, you know, women's magazines have beautiful young women on the cover and because we all like looking at them. There's a, well, except for the trend now, you know, the trend now is to have very large people as models now. Is that happening yeah. in Australia? 
well, there's a bit of that, but it doesn't seem to have really caught on. Well, it's <laughs> but, catching on here. I mean, I mean, of course, lots of men delude themselves into thinking it would be just gorgeous, wonderful to have this gorgeous young thing on their arm. Yeah. But I think in the end, I, I once looked at the stats on that. Most men marry or repartner women who are within a few ages of, of themselves. So they might, if they're asked a questionnaire about their most desirable partner, they'll say, yes, a 20-year-old. But they know they won't get her. I mean, only men with enormous wealth or assets or something right, right. success are able to attract women well yeah. out of their class um, in terms of the marriage market. And, and so, but most men are, end up being realistic about their partners. Um, and But I think we have a real problem with a lot of women being much less realistic about their choices and who's who's really available to them. There's just is- no question. I mean, it is, it, I mean, it is, massive over here i mean it's just a major major problem um in fact i just i just recorded a podcast talking about that very thing um in both the black and white communities this was new for me because i we were talking about how feminism has affected the black community as well as the white community which was a completely new subject for me um but there's there's quite uh there's a lot to say on that subject but anyway my point my point being that apparently um that high expectations is just rampant yeah and it's a it's a mentality there's a there's a guy here uh, that i think he's here i don't know where he is actually but he's got a youtube channel called kevin samuels and he talks to these young women and tries to show them and help them understand basic evolutionary biological patterns and how how it works and these young women are literally they they're trying to list they're trying to grasp what he's saying and it's just not working. They just don't see anything outside of them being at the center and what they're owed and what they deserve. I hate that word deserve. I have a thing about it. Can't stand it. But that is really a, a, a word that is used. It's just everyday language. What you deserve, you deserve the best. You, you, yeah. As if you did something just for being born, right? You just deserve. <laughs> so yeah. um, that mentality is really what is infecting so much of the what you're calling correctly calling woke women you know it's a very the woke mentality is part of this this is what it is and and interestingly i mean the woke women are the most intolerant um or for instance of one of the weird things it's not just choosing men who are attractive and successful and all the other things but also they want woke men um there's been some really interesting research showing how intolerant left-wing women are of political differences Mm -hmm. and so they won't date a man who voted for trump full stop i mean they're not even who listens to the wrong radio program or reads the wrong Mm -hmm. newspaper or Mm -hmm. whatever it is i mean left-wing women defriend their own Mm -hmm. friends on facebook if they express a political opinion they don't agree with i've been Um, hearing about it constantly for the last six to twelve months well ever since the you know the 2020 election but yeah yeah that's right and the um so the conservative men don't mind i mean of course although i used to get it from the other side because the conservative men it don't mind if they de- date someone who's prepared to debate with them and engage. no right 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 but they, what they can't stand is this judgmental yeah attitude right exactly exactly beliefs, where they just won't talk to people I mean, and I must say, I have. You know, it's been very sad for me in my recent, um, you know, media pile on last year. I mean, realizing I have lost some old friends who can't cope mm-hmm. with what they regard as my, you know, unacceptable political views, my unacceptable advocacy for men. And I mean, it says a lot more, but it says a lot. Of, sadly, a lot about our friendship. I was just going to say, yeah, like right. You, you I mean, just, mm-hmm. yep. Yeah. I mean, and I, I would never expected that. People I've known for 40 years who mm-hmm. I'm not talking to anymore, or who are not talking to me anymore. And who, because of um, the way you think, fact, I, I've, I work defending men, and that's mm-hmm. unacceptable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's, we know what interests me about that, though. I haven't had that experience, but um, did you ever, over the years, did the people ended up defriending you? you must have had things over the years where you kind of your antenna went up and you realized that they were inflexible 
and you didn't share the same opinions, but you just sort of let it go, I guess, because yeah. you were able to maintain a friendship, I guess. But in other words, were you surprised that the people who defriended you, that they were the ones that you have thought about in the past in that kind of a way? It's a mixture. I mean, there were people, I mean, I have friends who have totally different beliefs on almost every issue politically from me. Um, and yet we, ha we have a perfectly, you know, close, loving friendships. Um, and and we toler you know, very tolerant. We don't, the things we don't engage in because yeah. it would be too hard. Right. But uh, yeah, the others probably I could see it coming yeah, to some extent. That's what I meant. Right. And I'd stop talking to them about a whole range of things because mm -hmm. I just didn't want to know. Right. You know, so that, they would tell me endlessly what they were doing at work and they never asked me a single thing. Yes, that's it. what I mean. So, so that's what I mean. Like you really didn't lose anything at the end no, of the day. No. But, yeah. but, you know, it is, it's still sad. Yeah. Now, the other thing is interesting in all of this is the women's attitudes towards their, their husbands or their partner's friends. And that's another area where we see enormous <laughs> judgmental attitudes. You mean telling your husband who they should be friends with? Yeah, and right yeah. from the very beginning. Yeah. I mean, oh, sifting yeah. out unacceptable friends. Yeah. And, and and you know, no, you know, making it quite clear that you didn't really you don't really approve of him spending time with this person or that person or this group. I mean, that happens all the time. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. I mean, and and yet, you know, if you look at controlling behavior, this new, as I said, this new category of domestic violence, that's one of the things that the feminists define as controlling behavior. To you know, to isolate the woman from other friends. And that's exactly what women do all the time. All the time. It's, it's very, very rarely do men stop their wives from having the friends that they have. I don't even think I've, I've never even heard of that. That would be a very odd man. I mean, they just don't do that, but it's yeah. absolutely done in the reverse. It's sort of like weeding yeah. out the furniture when you first get married, right? You get rid of the bachelor furniture. <laughs> Yeah, he doesn't. Yeah, get, and I mean, I suppose not only friends, sadly, also relatives. I mean, the, the oh, control yeah. women have over even you know whether whether her, their partners are allowed to see their mothers very often, if at all. I mean, it's you know this has been. We should talk about that one day. Yeah, I've, that is I'm a whole conversation. I'm fascinated by, by mothers-in-law and how, how you yeah. know this traditional image of the mother-in-law tiptoeing around her daughter-in-law. Oh yeah. I'm Give already preparing for it, Bettina. I'm preparing oh, for no. it. And I have years still like, oh no, please. I hope, I hope you find somebody who's like, who likes me and thinks exactly the way I do. Otherwise I'm going to be tiptoeing around forever. We, 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 really, we will but... have to have a whole nother session. I yeah. just want to end by, that was a, a sort of broader issue, I suppose, which is the, which really worries me that there are now websites where women are sharing information about undesirable men and I mean, this applies to we have we have websites set up in Australia where they're going through the databases of men who have a violence order against you. Now you can, you know, this has become absolutely standard practice in divorce in Australia uh, that it gives a woman leverage in a divorce to make an accusation of violence. She can get the man removed from her home. She can stop him seeing his children. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the huge scandals when it comes to family law. It, in this yep. country and many other countries. Yep. And, and of course, lawyers are often advised men to accept this violence order rather than fight it for various legal reasons. And so there are men everywhere it's listed terrible. on with the AVOs and they're now publishing them on the internet, um, which is just terrifying. And then thank goodness, some, obviously some clever person managed to hack in and, and take this day. This oh, ridiculous. good, take it and down. Then, and then I was contacted by another man who said he had a brilliant idea. He was going to, because this database also gave information about who made the accusation. And we may, and we, maybe we should set up a website which publishes the data of who, who was making the complaint about the man, which I'm sure the women wouldn't mm. like at all. Anyway, that's by the by. But I noticed there was also a website which was talking about um, undesirable men, you know, this is what you should know about this man. He's had this history of whatever. Imagine you if know. men could do that for women. Were, yeah. Publishing Imagine. this on the internet. Undesirable. I, mean, I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, I just published a, something. I just noticed a, a, a newspaper article about it. That's taking the poisonous friend to a whole new level, isn't it? So one of the reasons why I've always argued that this you know, people will be like, how do you stop this? Or why is this okay for women to have carte blanche to do the things they do and men just have to sit there and take it? And of course they don't have to sit there and take it um, technically, 
but the, the, the problem is that I just did a video on this recently. Men are not cut out for emotional warfare with women. Yep. They don't do that well. They don't want to do that well. And they're torn when you have women behaving in this manner between wanting to, especially if it's their own women, you know, their wives or whatever, right. or girlfriends, wanting to quote unquote stand up for themselves, but also not wanting to fight with them. And Take so the they're, they're in this difficult space where how do you, how do you, how do you avoid that? How do you avoid fight? Which is why it looks like they're backing down sometimes, but they're not really backing down so much as just not engaging. It's just a very hard place for them to be is what I'm trying to say. Oh, so, yeah. so that's what makes it so much easier for women to do what they do and to, to it appear as though men are sort of taking it. It's, yeah. it, it, yeah, and right. then that makes the women do it even more, you know? And then if men do rise up, then they can't win because then they're abusive. So there's yeah. this, oh, yeah. it's just I mean, this terribly murky middle space where they don't know where to go and what to do. I mean, there's been, the years ago, I remember reading a research show you, in marital conflict, men are much, you know, if you measure their physiological responses to stress, they find that the whole experience much more stressful. You, all their measures of, of you know, not like coping the, physically with yeah. that, that event. The cortisone much, levels or whatever. Yeah, everything goes up. Yeah, for men, and you know, so it's a more painful. You're right. I mean, it's absolutely more painful experience for men, and let alone women tend to be. We're, we're much more skilled at pressing men verbally. Emotional. Yeah, yes. We know, we, we know exactly. Yes. Um, how to get at him if we want to. Right. Uh, we save up all our ammunition and kitchen sink it, and, and you know, I mean, women are extremely good at escalating conflict emotionally if we want to. Right. It's. To, and, I mean, I think it's to compensate for the fact that men are physically stronger. That yeah. that that's where they are. That's where women have a leg up, is on Absolutely. that. So they use it, and whether it's manipulation yeah. or whatever. And of course, we're not allowed to say this because that's bashing women, and we're we're sitting here talking about the sisterhood and how it's all about the sisterhood. And so you yeah. can't say anything negative about women as if they are off the hook from yeah. bad behavior and men are um, prone to it, but women are immune to it. Yeah. And it's totally logical that men would therefore pick their battles and, yes. you know, and let women walk all over yes. them in all sorts of mind. I mean, what's it, is it worth for me to go for a drink with this mate if she doesn't like him? Well, no, it's not. I mean, yes. I'd rather. Exactly. You know. That's what I mean. Like, like you yes. want to say to him, damn it, go have your drink. Who cares what, don't let her tell you what to do. You want to say that. And to some degree, that's true. That's true. But in the moment, depending on the context and the circumstances, he has to weigh that each time in his head. Yeah. And, and when you make it so that he has to consider fighting with you, he just says, screw it. It's just not worth it. And then he backs and yeah. that's it. And that's, that's the cycle. It's a terribly I, negative cycle that goes nowhere fast yeah. if it isn't overturned. And I mean, it is just extraordinary how powerless many women men are in their mm -hmm. relationships mm -hmm. in this culture which mm -hmm. presents men as yep. patriarchal dominating yes. controlling yeah i mean a real joke isn't it a complete joke that's not even women are spending all their time stealing themselves against something that isn't even in men's nature to do but that's part of the cultural lie when we talked at the beginning about the book i said there's four cultural lies that women have been told and that's part of it it's, yeah. it's that men are by nature going to hold you back and down. Meanwhile, it never even occurs to the average man to do anything like that. So you're stealing yeah. yourself against absolute, for absolutely no reason and creating drama where there just doesn't need to be any. Yeah. And the sort of happy wife, happy life. I mean, that is no question men's motto today of trying to keep their wives happy and sadly so often failing. Yeah, because it doesn't work that way. You can't make your wife happy. No. If you, you just can't, it just doesn't work that way. And, and tiptoeing around her isn't going to work. And that's, I mean, that's what I deal with, with the coaching all the time. It's just really hard. Mm -hmm. And you have to really train men to see that, that you're tiptoeing and trying to please her is actually making it worse. But then of course that gets into what are the skills? What do you do instead of that? Yep. We'll have to talk again, Suzanne. Um, so many, so, you know, there's so many areas we could, could have discussions about, Definitely. Um, but anyway, great pleasure having you there today. I'll just remind people again, tell me the name of your book so that people can rush out to Amazon. Oh yes. How to get hitched it. and stay hitched. 
and they can get, there's actually a website you could go how to get how to get hitched.net all okay. the information is there all right well i hope you get lots of orders lovely to talk to you so thanks tina talk to you again okay bye bye, bye.